want to welcome to our Wednesday 1130 Bible study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We're in a specific study on dealing with uh, how to cope with this virus, this COVID-19 virus that uh, we in America, Alabama, the world is uh, dealing with. And what I wanted to do was to do a series called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled in how to cope with it. How do Christians deal with crisis like this in their life? Because it's important that we understand how to cope with it in order to be able to take this message of coping correctly with it to other believers as well as unbelievers. And so I, I want to open with uh, an idea that, that is behind this, and, and that is equipping believers in, in uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, 16 and 17, it says that all scripture is inspired by God or God breathed, inhale and exhale. And uh, listen, to, listen to what it says as it follows that. It gives us instructions. It says that all scriptures is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness. Now watch those four things. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture, and I'm going to deal with some of that all scripture, but all scripture has been designed by God and is profitable. We, we like that word. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And now he tells you why. What is the divine design? That's why I've designed a, a lesson, let not your hearts be troubled. He says, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That we as believers can be equipped for every good work. And we have got a full schedule of doing good works during this time of crisis with the church. And as well as the world and how they're dealing with it. Now, my lesson today comes from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5. The context is verses 12 through 28. That This is how Paul ended that, that book of 1 Thessalonians. And I'm looking at verse 14, where he says, I urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. Be patient with all men. Now, actually, this began in 13 when he says, live in peace. In verse 13, live in peace with one another in verse 13. And it goes down to verse 26. There's a list. There are 17 imperatives given. I've told you this before. This is our sixth lesson in Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled, which began in John 14, 1 and verse 27. I've expanded that to this book of First Thessalonians, where Paul gave 17 imperative commands in the Greek language to how we should conduct ourselves as believers, as spiritual mature people, at in times of crisis. I want you to get that. The first 16, from verse 13 through 26, the first 16 Imperatives are present imperatives. Those are standing commands. The 17th imperative is in verse 26 when it says, greet all the brethren. Greet is an aorist. In other words, he rolls all these 16 present imperatives up into the final one when he says, greet each other. And then he goes on and talks about how we greet one another. Listen, it takes the conduct, the contact, the, sec, the, the 16 present imperatives to bring the 17, all wrapped up in the 17 is greet one another. Uh, greet, greet one another. Now, we're certainly learning a lot about social distancing. One of the things that the church is great about is hugging and being close to people and, and shaking hands and all of that, and we haven't been able to do any of that. In fact, the church has been shut down itself uh, by the state 
which is interesting in, in uh, legal terms. But the church has honored that because of a crisis epidemic. We have honored that. We've honored it here, even though we don't like the idea of the state shutting us down. We have honored that in a time of crisis. The wonderful thing is the Internet. We've gone to the Internet to keep our people spiritually up to date and keep them advancing and to equip them for every good work. And that's what I'm involved in today. This is our sixth lesson. It will do, do, it will do you well to go back and look at Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled, the series on Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. We're in the sixth lesson today. And the sixth lesson today is in verse 14, be patient with all men. Be patient with all men. We're going to take a look at that today. After several weeks of being shut up in our homes under state, the same home edict by the state, this lesson entitled Be Patient probably should have been taught earlier. And I thought about that, but I waited so that it would maybe the lesson results would be, would be better in the sense that you now need it and maybe would use it. Because what comes out of being shut up like this in a crisis is domestic abuse and violence. And we'll talk about that today after a word of prayer. Let's have this word of prayer. Let me say to you, in introduction to our prayer, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sin, sins of the tongue or overt sins. What do I do? How, what do I do? I'm in carnality. How do I get back to spirituality? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin... God is faithful and just to forgive me through the blood of Christ. He will forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness through the blood of Christ. Verse 7 in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. Both Adamic sin, the 13 judicial charges held against every member of the human race, but also personal sin of a believer. When we confess our sin, I, I am... I am removed from carnality and into spirituality. I'm back under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's really important, especially for Bible study, because John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit has been sent into my life to teach and recall the word of God in me and through me to other people. So let's have this word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins should be three categories to look at and make confession. You do it in silence. You do it through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, and you do it to the Lord. Well, our Father, we're thankful today that we have the freedom to assemble. Even though our church is not able, we are able to assemble within our church and bring this message by the Internet. I am thankful for all of those who will visit with us on our internet and for the study of the word of God, that they may know how to deal with pressures of living in a crisis situation. One they did not create. It was not volitional. It was sent to us. It was given to us. We know that it's not bad. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. And we must always remember that as we deal with it, and that will help us to deal with it properly. Today, we're told to be patient. Macro through Maya, to be patient. But how can I be patient when there's no end to the crisis? There's no light at the end of the tunnel as far as the resolution to the virus. Well, let me tell you, people, God is in charge. And we know that, Father. We know you are in charge. 
at least we know it as a principle. But now it's become time for reality. Who's in charge of your life? The state? No, no, no. That's temporal. Eternal is God. So, Father, we understand that. So help us today to understand how to cope with the pressures of a crisis by the principle of a command, a standing command in the present imperative. Be patient. We pray, make this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, here we are. Today's lesson is going to look at three aspects out of the standing command to the Christian under crisis, be patient. The Greek word that is used for be patient is interesting because it's makrothrumaya, and that's a compound Greek word. Macro is long or, or great period, and thumaya is a, is a temper. Temper. And so these two Greek words together are really important, and it's going to be the subject we have today. There's another Greek word that's used in the English. It just says patient, be patient. Our word here is ma macro through maya. But there's another word, hupomone. And in the English, you don't know which one you have. If it's hupomone, then it, it means to be able to abide under your pressure and to wait patiently for God to bring relief, both in it and from it. Now, it's important you understand that part. That's not our word. That's not our word. This one is macrothumaya. Macrothumaya is a compound word meaning long-tempered under pressure. It means to be, it means to restrain one's temperament in the face of provoca, provoca, uh, uh, provocative situations that could be for a long-term stress. I'm going to say that again. Macrothumaya means to restrain one's temperament in face of provocation, especially in long-term stress situations. That is our word. We have been in this crisis, COVID-19, for a month shut up. We have been shut up in our homes, away from our businesses, away from our churches for a month. And we're beginning to really feel the stress of that. How much longer, boy, we don't know. If we're talking about until we get an antidote, a vaccine, we could be months. We could be a year from now in this. How, how, how could we ever make that? Listen to me. God had a special word for special times like these. Be patient, macrothumaya. You're going to have to learn how to be profitable in your soul during that time. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof for training in righteousness so that we can be adequately equipped. And we are through all scripture. And one of those all scriptures is 1 Thessalonians 5.14, where it says, be patient, macrothumaya. And so I'm going to teach you how to do that today. I'm going to teach you how to do that. You've probably heard, as I've heard people say, it takes a lot for me to become angry. You may have heard others say, I know I am quick-tempered, 
but I can't help myself. I've heard that from Christians. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Both of these have a common denominator in behavior. They have a common denominator. Both of them are worldly thinking and fleshly behavior. Worldly thinking and fleshly behavior. These are, these are not true to the Christian life. These are true to the unbeliever. This is the way the unbeliever lives because he does not have the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is not the, the main book in his life that he reads. But for the world, these are worldly terms. These are worldly terms. For the one person, it takes a lot for me to become angry. It shouldn't take anything for a believer. There should be nothing. Or the other argument, I know I am quick-tempered, but I can't help myself. None of those are true for a believer. They are true for the unbeliever because he, he is void of the Holy Spirit of God and, and, and the scriptures that give him the dynamics of living through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is not true. These are not true. You should not say these. When you hear yourself say these things, you're lying to yourself. These are not true. God wouldn't command you to be patient under macrothumia if he wouldn't equip you. Now, you cannot do this in yourself. You cannot do this in your flesh. The world doesn't understand what I'm saying, but the church of Jesus Christ should understand what I'm saying to you. I'm just reading the Bible to you. This is a standing command on the Christian life in long-term crisis. Now, let's get down to business. Point number two. My lesson today will address both sides of this issue. It takes, it takes a lot to make me angry. It don't take anything to make me angry. Let's take a look at that. Because both of those are coping mechanisms. They're both coping in different ways, but they're both coping. And they're coping by a common denominator, worldly thinking and fleshly behavior. And they're connected. They're connected because they've believed a lie and they're behaving based on a lie. As a Christian, I'm not speaking to the unbeliever today. I'm speaking to the Christian. This is unacceptable behavior. This is unacceptable. See, both of those are talk about self-restraint. One person has self-restraint, he pats himself on the, on the back. The other, people, the other person doesn't have self-restraint, and so he lets it fly. He gets it off his chest. He tells you how it is. Neither one of them are right. And if you're a Christian, they're operating from the wrong, from the wrong principle and premise. It doesn't matter if the one bites his tongue and stays hurt inside or whether he lets, lets it fly and then has to deal with wounding words and behavior. It's unacceptable. It does not have to be. You're behaving out of a lie of a worldly concept, which we call cosmos diabolicus. It's a lie. I've told you it's a lie. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's your business because God says, be patient. You say, I can't be patient. I, I've tried to. For the one person, he thinks he is because he's using self-restraint. And he can do that for a while, but even he knows at some point he boils up and blows out. Come on. When he says, 
It takes a lot for me. It means there is a boiling point. Neither are acceptable. We will address let the let it fly approach. Let it fly approach. I want to address that today because I'm concerned with domestic abuse and violence that is occurring right now across the world, not just in Alabama, not just in Birmingham, Alabama, not just in America. It is on the rise and increase. It is up over 25%. The violence, the abuse is out of, the, the abuse is out of calculation. The abuse is so much. It has jumped like 700%, the abuse. The violence, I'm talking about things that should people put people in jail. They can't put them in jail because they're letting people in the jail out for the same thing. Because of the virus. Domestic violence, things that should put you in jail. are worldwide of over an increase of 25%. So let me talk to you a little bit about the attitude of let it fly, because in both of these, eventually, you're going to let it fly. For the person that says, I have self-restraint self up to a point, and then I let it go. And the other person says, I don't even hesitate. I let it go. So I want to deal with let it fly approach to a stressful situation, and I'm going to use an example from the Bible, Balaam and his donkey. It comes from Numbers, the 22nd chapter, well worth your read, and, I, and it's about domestic violence. Believe it or not, this passage is about domestic violence in stressful situations. Numbers 22 you can start reading somewhere around 22 and 35. I'm just going to tell you the story and hit the highlight. Balak was in conflict with Israel. The king, Balak, was in conflict with Israel, and he hired Balaam, a well-known prophet, to put a curse upon Israel. You can read about that in Numbers 22, 1 through 6. This is how this whole thing began. God intervened and told Balaam not to curse Israel in chapter 22, 7 through 14. Barak, the king Barak, ordered, uh, offered Balaam more money, and Balaam accepted it. I mean, it was an offer he couldn't refuse. You can read about that in the 22nd chapter, 15 through 21. God responded to Balaam's decision to go ahead and put a curse on Israel and sent the angel of the Lord to intervene or to interfere, actually, with it, even with death. Oh, Whoa, even with death. You can read that in verse 22, chapter 22, 22. This brings me to the illustration that I want to give you about domestic violence in times of great stress, crisis. The donkey of Balaam, this was his mode of transportation, and he loved his donkey, his mode of, of transportation, and it was his favorite form of transportation. Been with the donkey, and the donkey had been with him a long time, and the donkey had always been good transportation. All of that's in this story. The donkey Balaam, now the donkey of Balaam saw what Balaam was blind to see, 
the angel of the Lord, because of Balaam's secondary negative volition to the revealed truth, don't pronounce a curse upon Israel. See, there's primary negative volition. I don't want to hear it. And there's a second negative volition. I don't want to do it. Primary, I don't want to hear it. Secondary, I don't want to do it. Don't curse Israel. Uh, I got to do it. The money's too good. Remember that the God sent the angel of the Lord to interfere with Balaam going to put a curse upon Israel. What the donkey saw that Balaam didn't because of secondary negative volition was the angel of the Lord stood in the middle of the road with a sword drawn for death. Every time, and he saw it three times, the first time the donkey veered off the road, of course, saw the danger ahead, saw the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword. Balaam, the response, was to whip the donkey. Got back on the road, went a little further down the road, there stood the donkey, there stood the angel with the sword. Donkey went off the road, got beat again. Third time, they were going across the bridge. There stood, the, there was nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Can't go to the right, can't go to the left. If you go on, you're going to die. The donkey sat down. And Balaam beat him an inch of his life and told him if he didn't go forward, he was going to kill him. I'll just kill you and walk. You know what that is? That's domestic violence. That's domestic violence. How did Balaam deal with additional stress on the stress, the crisis? Each time the donkey didn't do it his way, or angry until he just, not only did he blow out, he beat him three times. The last time he told him he was going to kill him. Told him he's going to kill him. And you ought to read the conversation that the donkey and Balaam had. <laughs> I know you didn't hear me. You should have heard the comment. Now, listen, do you suppose Balaam can talk donkey? No, but you know what? The donkey could talk Balaam. You talking about speaking in tongues? There you got one. How about that one? How about that one? The donkey spoke to Balaam. And you should read this conversation in chapter 22, 28 through 30. Because you know what it was? Common sense. Being reasonable. Something that Balaam was not in the midst of a crisis. And Balaam, it never dawned on him that the angel of the Lord had been sent to protect his life. And if he went out against the will of God, he was going to die the sin unto death. It never rang a bell until the donkey explained it to him. <laughs> Do 
Do you know who should have explained to the donkey? It should have been Balaam explaining to the donkey what he was going through and how tough it was going to be on them to get to the other side. How he was going to have to change his mind about what God told him. That he was going to have to stop going against the will of God and start going against the will of the king Balak. And he would probably lose all of his money and everything else. Think about that. The donkey, the donkey reasoned with him. He gave him common sense. Just gave him common sense. You see, Balaam took his anger out on his faithful and loyal domestic donkey. That's domestic abuse, violence. This is abuse gone violent. This is abuse gone violent. This is abuse gone violent. There is no place for that in the life of a Christian. None. Even a donkey knows that's not right. Domestic violence always rises during times of great stress crisis, whether it's personal or community or nationally, like now during the COVID-19. Projecting blame or taking it out on others doesn't resolve the problem. In fact, it just creates more. And so, after the conversation with the donkey, in verse 31 of Numbers 22, after a conversation with a donkey who gave him common sense, the Lord with a sword in his hand opened the eyes of Balaam. Verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam through a donkey. He did it with Peter with a rooster. He did it with the apostle Peter with a rooster. The angel of the Lord then spoke to Balaam the truth of the word of God. In other words, now he had to retell him. He had to go back to the beginning and tell Balaam what God's will was. The angel of the Lord spoke to Balaam the truth of the word of God, which had been previously e explained and refused, rejected. See, he always brings you back to the scene of where it all began and tell you, Let's do it different. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Put off worldly thinking and put on divine viewpoint. Put off fleshly and put on spiritual life. See, that's the answer to this whole business. Just depends on whether you have positive volition or negative volition. If you have positive volition, you'll think like a donkey. If you have negative volition, you'll think like a carnal person. Or an unbeliever. I get my pound of flesh. I'm going to get my pound of flesh. You can read about that in Numbers 22, 32, 33. You know what Balaam did? He was a smart guy. 
Listen to what it says he did in verses 34, 35. Balaam confessed his sin to the Lord and renewed his mind towards the will of the Lord. See, there's two parts to that, and you missed them. Just like so much, you go to church and you don't listen. Your pastor teaches the truth to you and you don't listen. You think you already know it all. You don't listen. So you can prove your point later that the word of God doesn't work. Bible doctrine, nah, it's not important. Now let me tell you what he had to do on that bridge because he ain't going nowhere. He's trapped. And it's a good thing. Number one, he confesses his sin. You can read it in 34 and 35. He confesses his sin. The second thing he does, he has to renew the thinking of his mind to be compatible with the will of God. See, that's Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24. You got to put off the old man. You got to renew your mind and put on the new man. You see, between the old man and the new man is this renewing of the mind. Between the old man and the new man is the renewing of the mind. The old man mind has now been exchanged for the new man thinking by the renewing of your mind. He had to go back. To, he had to go back and say, look, I know the Lord told me not to go put a curse on Israel. But listen, the devil sweetened the pot. I had to take it. You know, that's who sweet, you, know, you do know that's who sweet, sweeted the pot. <laughs> Come on now. You know, that's, who, that's the one who always does it to get you to go against the will of God. He's always out to betray Christ. There's always a Judas that can be bought. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be you to be bought. Listen, he'll buy you as cheap as he can get you to humiliate you. But the Lord will always stand in your way with a drawn sword. And you would be wise to stop, get upon your knees before God and confess your sins and renew the thinking of your mind so that it works according to the will of God and not the will of man. I hope you're listening to me today. We could stop. Listen, what, listen you think that this domestic abuse and violence is only occurring in the world? No, it's occurring in the church. The church is not able to come to church. I hope those who are listening on the Internet are taking this serious. This is a worldwide crisis, domestic abuse. That's what's coming out of all this mess. It's not bad enough that everybody's in the same boat in a storm, but people on the boat are attacking each other. I mean, how bad a crisis is that? Here's my final point. Every church age believer has an immediate spiritual coping mechanism for worldly, fleshly, distressed behavior, such as I've just mentioned. Immediate. Immediate. I mean, you take this, boom, done immediate we're talking about in a second boom done if you're a believer I'm speaking to believers today you say what <laughs> what could that possibly be you mean boom there it is yep there it is every time you get in that stressful thing and you want to take it out at others you don't have to take it out on yourself. 
You don't have to take it out on others. That's the two ops that people have of coping. No cerebot. You can give it, you can give your flesh over to the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside your life. You do know that the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside your body, and your body became the temple of God, a mobile church. You do know that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit in the church age under the new covenant at the point of salvation. Eight works the Holy Spirit does at the point of salvation. You can find it in the 50 things on our website, doctrinal studies, doctrinalstudies.com. You should, you should pick it up, print it off, and read it. It's free. No cost you anything. We never ask you for anything except your attention. Listen. You know what it's called in the Bible? It's called walking by means of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Practice the presence of the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. Boom, there it is. There it is. There it is. Here it is, Galatians 5, 16, 17. But I say, walk by the Holy Spirit. See that word walk, peripateo? It means in every cir cir circumstance of your life. This will always work no matter what the stress. No matter what, it will always work. It's a present active imperative. It's a present imperative. Just like be patient is a present imperative. Walk, peripateo, is a present active imperative Second person plural. It applies to all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I say, walk by the Spirit, by means of the Holy Spirit. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh, your sin nature. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. That's the story of Balaam. And the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition. That's the angel of the Lord interfering. So that you may not do the things that you please. God wants you to do the things that pleases him. Hebrews 11, 6. Come on now. Walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit is a choice and a decision you make personally. Whether you walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. But I say, walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Boom, that's immediate. I say to you, walking in the Spirit is your right choice. If you walk in the flesh, if you go down and read Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it talks about all that it comes out of that, walking in the flesh. Walking in the flesh is walking with the right decision. The immediate benefit from walking by means of the Holy Spirit, now listen to me, is found in Galatians 5, walk in the Spirit is 16, 17. The bad things that can happen from walking in the flesh is verses 19 through 21. Now watch this. The benefits from walking in the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, verses 22 and 23. Now if you got your Bible, you ought to turn with me to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says the fruit of the Spirit is. The word fruit is singular. All of these by themselves are dynamic. And you're familiar probably with love, joy, peace. Are you looking at them? Patience. See the word patience? That's our word. That's macro through maya. That's our word. That's not hupomaneo. No, no, no. This is our word. This is the word of our lesson today.
love, joy, peace, patience. Fourth one in, that's a fruit. The moment you begin walking in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to put the fruit on the table that is necessary for good spiritual health. And in this case, he's going to put patience and then kindness and goodness and gentleness. Here's the second one he's going to give you, self-control. Ingratia. Ingratia is a temperament. It refers to inner strength. Inner strength. To give you the inner strength to do the right thing, to do the will of God. Against such there is no law. You see, walking by means of the Holy Spirit is the first line of winning the battle over the war of the flesh and the world. But it is only a temporary fix in the Christian life. You have to maintain that walk and not sin. When you are tempted to sin like Balaam, you can't give in to it. You have to give in to the Holy Spirit. You have to yield to the Spirit, not to the flesh. You have to, you have to yield to the, to the desire of the Spirit, not the desire of the flesh. You have to learn how to do that through inner dialogue. When that stuff happens to you, you there begins an inner dialogue. Well, what about this? What about that? You got to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. You got to give in. You got to yield to the desire of the spirit rather than the desire of the flesh. Now, in the beginning of learning this process, it's going to be difficult because the desire of the flesh has dominated your life and is a very strong desire. But if you learn to give that up and to walk in the spirit, soon this walking in the spirit is a stronger desire than that old desire. This will be an old desire. That has no benefit compared to this one, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's as far as I can get today. I can't get to a second line of defense. This is enough for today. This is certainly enough for today. Be patient. Macrothumia. Don't give in to the flesh. Don't, get in, don't give in to the old patterns of behavior of worldly fleshly thinking. Rather choose to go the scriptural way. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit teach you how to live the Christian life. He will teach it to you. He will mechanically teach it to you. It's his job, John 14, 15, and 16. It is his job. It's his ministry to your life. How important it is. It should be really important during this time of crisis. Don't go, this, don't go the way of the world thinking and flesh. Don't go that way. Even though, even though it's been a pattern in your life, break that pattern and go with a spiritual pattern. Go with a spiritual pattern, not a carnal pattern. Not an old man, cosmos diabolicus thinking pattern. Go new man, divine viewpoint thinking. It's going to require the confession of your sin. It's going to require you renewing your mind to how God desires you to live the Christian life in the power, the dynamics of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit by you walking in the Holy Spirit, listening to the desires of the Spirit over the desires of the flesh and giving yourself, yielding to that. That's my prayer for you today in Jesus' name. Our Father, we pray this over this lesson in the lives of people that have come to hear it. I pray they would sit and study it and understand it and begin to practice it. 
practice the presence of the power of the person of the Holy Spirit that lives in their life. And John 14, 16, never permitted to leave it. This is how we face the crisis. This is how we face an emergency immediately in our life. Don't give in to the flesh. Give in to the spirit. Don't yield to the flesh. Don't yield to the desire of the flesh. Yield to the desire of the Holy Spirit. Teach us that, Father. Teach us that. The church of Jesus Christ is in desperate need in this hour to learn it and then teach it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.